Hi everyone, this is Maha Bailey from the American University in Cairo, and today we're going to be doing uh, Tiny Demons, which is a liberating structure and development. We have uh, Shekhar and Alex with us as participants, and Lise is going to lead us through the structure. Lise, introduce yourself and uh, get started. Hi, I'm Lise. Um, I live and work in the UK in the health service, but I'm a user of liberating structures, so always excited to share liberating structures with others. So uh, we, should we jump in? Should we just jump in to Tiny Demons? So I'm going to share my screen and share some slide decks. And uh, big thanks to Nancy White, because I have adapted some slides that she had already done. So um, Tiny Demons or Drawing Monsters, I think it has two names, is a liberating structure in development or sometimes described as a punctuation. And it comes from the work of, of Linda Barry, who wrote this awesome book. Um, uh, so, uh, Mish Maha and I both have a copy of So, uh, we're going to jump in and you guys are going to have a go. So, I just want you to write down a list of, we'll go for four, fears, anxieties or uncertainties on your mind when it comes to online facilitation. So, I'll just give you a minute to do that. Hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you monitoring people to see if they look like they're done yeah, or do you want people to let you know? Shaki looks like he's done. Alex is still like writing his list. So I'm going to move you on. So hopefully you've all got a piece of paper and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's like a bit of scrap paper you're going to throw away afterwards and just need to divide it, either fold it or just draw and divide it into and we'll go for four. You can do this for six, you can do it for eight, but we'll do four pieces. Yeah. And if it's in a notebook, you can just draw a line and create yourself four segments. You're all done. And then in each of your boxes, I want you to draw one round shape, one three-sided shape, one four-sided shape, and a squiggly line. Yeah, well done, Maha. Yeah, that's a good one. Show me your, show me your, uh, well, then I know you're done. Yay, Alex is done. Yeah, great, you're all done. And now what I want you to do is turn the shapes in each box into monsters or demons. So you can do that by adding whatever you like, teeth, hair, wings, claws. They can be as abstract or as to real life monsters as you wish them to be. So I have a question here because we didn't discuss uh, what the structure does. Um, and my question with this is, as we're drawing the monsters, these are just monsters. This has nothing to do with what we wrote just earlier. At the, just at the moment, just draw some monsters and then we'll connect the two as a next step.
yeah, well done, beautiful. <laughs> And I guess people can go as you know wild as they want with this. I'm excited to see Maha and Alex's monsters because they're uh, taking great care of them. We good? Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so now you can um, look back at your list that you made earlier of your four fears. And I want you to um, decide which one corresponds to which monster you draw and which one kind of looks the most like that monster to you. And uh, name them. Your all four monsters now got a name. And then you're gonna are you done? Are we good? Are we ready to move on? Are you still going? Oh, they're still thinking how the the men are still thinking hard. I don't know, Agent Alex is good. And, and you're going to pick one now that you want to see differently, that you want to think about in a different way. So just pick one of your monsters that you want to explore a bit more, work with a bit more. So um, if we were a bigger group, we'd now either go into pairs or into fours, which is good because you're already a three, and um, you're, we're going to share your monsters and, um, I guess, describe what it is and together reflect, um, you know, as you see your demon in a new way, maybe what becomes possible, what, what makes you, um, what, what can you think about differently? So I don't know if anyone wants to share the first. How much time would you normally give us? Because usually liberating structures give you a time frame yeah. to talk about it's it. The punctuation is quite a quick one. I would say about three minutes each to share your monster. So okay. for about nine minutes, two to three minutes. Okay. Each. Yeah. Sounds good. I can share really quickly since I'm unmuted anyway. Go for it. So my four uh, monsters were, uh, let me just make it easier to see. So the first one is connection issues, which we were talking about earlier. Blue screen on my computer, which just happened to Lisa a few times, or once at least uh, today. <laughs> um, offending people, which I'm really happy I made a monster with different looking arms, because I think there's so many different ways to offend people while you're facilitating. So. And then the one that I actually want to work with is unresponsive audience. And I'm, I'm happy that I had a monster looking the other way because that's a good one representing Great. unresponsive audience. Okay. 
Um, but shall I listen to everyone else and then yeah, we can talk about the one we want to see differently? Yeah, that's great. I'll like go next. So um, here are my four monsters. So um, I just have to see what they are now. Um, so this is, uh, this is the tech breaker. He destroys technology. Uh, and this is uh, Voidian. Oh. He just eats. Um, so that's the one I'd like to work on. Um, that Sorry, is we, we, your voice cut up for a second. Is the Voidian is like talking to a void or what? Is yeah, that? so it's that idea of you're talking and there's like no responsiveness and it, it feels like you're talking to a void. So he just mm -hmm. eats everything. Uh, so this is uh, Clocus. He's the one that makes sure you, you're never, you never finish everything you're trying to do. Um, and this is um, her or who. Um, this is sort of like that. This is more of a facilitation fear rather than an online facilitation fear, which is um, that sense that people are not going to be able to follow along, uh, that you sort of laid it out, but people somehow stumble and you know, how, to, how to deal with that. And the one I'd like to work on is the speaking into a void one, which is actually remarkably similar to the one that Maha chose. It really is. It really is. Right. Do you want to share your monsters? Yeah. Um, so for, I'm going to not go in the usual cycle. I'm going to start with uh, Mr. BSOD, which is an I. Uh, it's somewhat like the Illuminati, which is always watching and anything that can go wrong will actually go wrong. It is for the technical issues. That's what We've it had that represents. That gremlin has been with it. <laughs> I have a distractiton, which is um, my attendee as a facilitator and my inability to read the room and trying to do too many things at once or trying to always catch up uh, and, and this squiggly line essentially takes me through my journey of everything, but finally, hopefully getting to the center of what I need to do. Mr. What What has uh, two ears and Mr. Mr. What What represents lack of attendee motivation. I'm not entirely sure if everybody's there for the same reason or they really necessarily want to be there or do they have to be there. And so confused a lot, which is uh, again, my own fear uh, and representing the incongruence between virtual and physical spaces. So uh, very similar to Distractaton, and I'm going to work on Sir Confused a lot. Okay, so um, you've shared your monsters and you've reflected um, on them. I wonder if you're able to see the ones you want to work with in a different way and, and what might enable that. So Maha, you talked about um, the audience, the audience. Yeah, I was talking about unresponsive audience and I didn't get creative with naming the monsters. I just named them what, what I wanted them to be. Um, it's very funny because the way I drew her is influencing how I'm looking at the problem now because I drew her as looking the other way, but I've still got one of her eyes. So I think what I'm trying to see about the unresponsive audience is even when they're not as responsive as I expect them to be, I might, ha I might have a bit of their attention and trying to figure out what it is that will, you know, th they're still not completely. So I'm not thinking of the audience where they turn off their camera and mute and leave. I'm thinking about the audience that are still there, but they're, and they're looking at me and everything, but they're not responding when I ask a question or when I make a joke or something like that. Um, and trying to think now of, well, what element of them do I have and what kind of, I don't know if, if you can actually anticipate them. Sometimes you can, but not always. Um, and just trying to think of always having, I think, a plan B when, when you do something that has to be really interactive and then making it interactive in a different way or I'm, I'm still thinking about it, to be honest. I want to hear what Alex has to say. <laughs> yeah, Alex, yours was a similar one, right? The, yeah, the void. I guess I was thinking about how I imagine this as sort of a monster that's sort of sitting there and sort of sucking in what I'm saying and sort of not, um, it not going through. Um, and I was thinking how that, how sort of it describes my own sense of disempowerment that isn't there, that there isn't something I can do. 
Alex has got sort of a conception of the issues a little bit. Hmm? We lost you again. Well, I lost you again for a second. There's another one of these monsters with us. Sorry. Sorry about that. I was just saying that um, the way I conceived of the Voidian, like the thing is it stands sort of uh, uh, across from me and sort of eats the words or the things I'm trying to do. But listening to Mach, I realized that that's a disempowering way of describing that situation, right? Because it's um, there are things that I can do that can perhaps sort of alter that dynamic. It's not that that monster is always sitting there and whatever I do, that result will happen. So um, the way, like, I guess this happens with fears, right? The way you describe the fear is, um, is, um, uh, is disempowering. So uh, I, think, I think what Maha helped me to see in listening to her reflection is to take this, take this fear of talking to the void and figure out how I can empower myself, like, which is, what Maha was saying, like figure out um, maybe alternative approaches, maybe this is what I want to do or what I want to present or showcase or sort of explain, maybe come up with a couple ideas there and sort of figure out what's going to work on the day, maybe something like that. Right. Uh, go for it. Your monster uh, was slightly different. Wasn't it? I had, uh, so I wanted to work on Sir, uh, Sir Confused a lot, which is an inner monster or a demon. And the, the representation primarily is this uh, lack of confluence between the physical space and the virtual space where I'm, I feel like I'm a lot more comfortable in a physical space because I'm used to it. And just the ability to read the room and you know planning for things going wrong, the ability to manipulate physical objects and space around you. So I feel like I often try to overcome, or my demon often tries to um, overcompensate for that in the virtual space, which leads to potentially more confusion. Uh, from a constructive uh, perspective, there could be a lot more planning and an appreciation of what these differences are. Some conversations in groups like these about what, what folks have learned uh, from practice themselves and and from each other as well. And just the, um, the principle of keeping things simple. It is completely all right to do less, less is more. So, so, so confused a lot, hopefully we'll do less and we'll get more out of it and be less confused. Maha, you, you just, just gave me a really good idea. Yeah, you just gave me an idea there because I was thinking about how my, my issue with unresponsive audiences one of the things I was thinking about is, how about if I start the session, let people know, by the way, this is the kind of session this is going to be, and it's going to be like this and this and this, but not only telling them what I think the session is, because I've seen sessions where they talk about this also to ensure equity, kind of like saying, always talk I, not we, always, I don't know, make room for other voices. But what about if I also ask them, what are things that would make you uncomfortable in this space? Like, how would you like to interact in this space? And people can let me know ahead of time, I'd rather not, you don't call on me or I'd rather participate by a chat or I'd rather work in breakout rooms. Maybe poll them or just ask them to write in the chat or something so that early on, first of all, they know it's gonna be interactive, but they also have some agency in how they want to be interactive. And then I also have an idea because usually when I think about it, an unresponsive audience is not a problem if 25% of people are responsive. You just need some people to be responsive. You don't need every single person to be responsive. It's usually fine uh, you know, if 25% are responsive, but it's just the problem is like when 90% or 99% are not responsive. So. Cool, great. Does anyone want to share anything else about their monsters before we just move on to one next step? Okay, so now what I want you to do is to take that monster that you just worked with and, and draw it in a different way now. So draw it, maybe you're dancing with it or you're friends with it or you're talking to it. it you know, you're, you're, you're developing a different way of looking at this monster. So draw it again on a clean sheet of paper and yeah, draw it dancing or having fun with you.
Can you good? Now, I, if um, I wasn't having a technical monster myself, I could play you some music right now and you could like hold them up to the screen and dance. <laughs> I've got a gremlin going on there. I can't hear any sound on my machine. But um, do you want to share your dancing monsters with us? And in a real room, I have literally danced around a room with a monster. Um, um, do you want to share? Oh, Maha, you're on mute. Yeah, mine isn't really dancing. We're shaking hands and talking. So we're connecting. Um, and she's got both eyes looking at you now. No. Just one eye, still. Yeah, yeah well, you're in profile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alex, have you? Mine is, mine is just, I didn't know, uh, I didn't include myself. Maybe that's the mistake, but it's giving me a thumbs up. And it's also wiggling. I don't know if that counts as dancing. <laughs> and also his mouth is much, much smaller because now he's talking. He's not just eating words. I love it. Shakir, Shakir? Um, I went very similar to Maha. We're, we're giving each other a high five. And the monster has eyes and is winking, uh, essentially saying, we got this. Great. Well, that's it. You've drawn your monsters. You've done tiny demons drawing monsters. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about how it was for you. Just like reflect on it. Like, what did you like it? What did it make possible? Would you use it? When might you use it? What did you notice? I think I would use it uh, in my teaching with my students, like about their fears for the next semester or their fears from last semester and how it's influencing how they're thinking about learning again online for next semester um, and giving them an opportunity to sort of see that a lot of them share the same fears and think about how they might overcome them. Um, I'm always concerned with university students if they'll think Things like this for adults is really fun. And it's just trying to think about whether undergrads will be like, ah, it'll make me do this. But I think there's a lot of value in using pen and pencil and paper when you're together online. Uh, so, so not just the drawing part of it, but just the sitting and looking away from the screen. And then the creativity of, of you know, making a monster mean something related to an actual abstract idea, like a fear. Um, and then this part about trying to then solve, you know, not solve a problem, but just see it differently. I like that the question is about seeing it differently rather than solving the problem, because I think when you see it differently, and it's very funny because I was looking to Alex to get a help on my problem, but then the way I framed my problem helped him see his problem differently. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, kind of cool. Yeah, I, so I think the sharing part was also really useful. I definitely noticed there were very common themes with everybody's monsters, weren't there? Like all of them were. So I think it helps the group to establish, actually, we've all got some similar worries or concerns about whatever. And, and obviously you would um, use the invitation in whatever your context is. So it doesn't, you know, we did it, we did it online uh, facilitation because it was a shared context. We could all um, uh, connect with that theme, but you can use it for anything. And I think Maha, your idea of the start of a start of a new semester, you know, what's your fears about learning this semester would be a really good one. It's interesting because Linda Barry, of course, does work with undergraduate students, and uh, that's what she does, right? I think so. Um, maybe some tips from her in terms of maybe share the book, show them the book. Like I haven't made this. <laughs> um, Anybody else want to share? Did they like it? Would they use it? What did it make possible? I'll go. Um, I'm a theory nerd, so I tend to connect um, what what are the learning outcomes. What's the objective of the exercise? And for me, that you know, listing down four fears or anxieties um, is a powerful way of uh, focusing on the metacognitive element of your knowledge or learning. I'm not entirely sure which activity, like it just doesn't come to mind quickly what, what this specific exercise could be used, but certainly parts of it, right? The playfulness element of it, um, just reflecting on what was and the ability to see it a different way. Certainly there are elements that, that, that I 
can incorporate into other other activities. But I'll need to think a little more about where where specifically this exercise as a whole could be used. Yeah, I think there's a challenge a little bit in figuring out how to um, incorporate something that's playful, for example, in my own work, which is sort of fairly professional and sort of creative stuff I do. Uh, I think that that's a much better fit. And I've already promised, my, promised them that something like this is, is, is gonna happen very soon. Um, but one thing I wanted, and I, I, I agreed with um, the things that uh, Mahan Sheikh here mentioned already, so I'm not gonna repeat them. I only wanted to call attention to one thing that wasn't mentioned is the idea of naming I also think is really important. Uh, um, sort of listing your fears is very empowering, but also giving them a name, sort of naming the fear, like like the skull face, like that's who you are. And I think that activity is fairly um, uh, fairly empowering and well, maybe transformative is too strong a word, but I find that to be one of the um, the more interesting parts of uh, the structure. Right. I'd actually like to follow up on that just quickly. One of uh, you know, some of my own personal experiences and from what I've uh, heard and seen students do, the naming element that Alex focused on creates a shared language, right? If this is something that's done early on in the semester, it kind of becomes a recurring theme over the semester that students can go back to and it creates a shared language among them that, that brings about memories of coming together. Yeah. I really like that and the kind of continuity it creates and then it becomes like what you guys did is you gave them playful names and then you know somebody who's like I don't know late with an assignment oh I had a sir whatever his name was the one with the disconnection issues today or it's kind of cool I like it. I think it's a technique used in um, ther CBT therapy with kids actually naming a fear. Or cognitive name. behavioral therapy? Yeah. yeah. This is the second video I make where people are talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. I think everyone needs therapy at the end of this pandemic anyway, so we might as well start now, right? And I'm by no manner of means an expert on, on those things, but I think it is a technique that is used, particularly working with young people, but uh, maybe with adults too. Oh my God, I should do it with my child. Like we've been saying, we're gonna do things with our kids together, Lisa, and this is definitely one of them. I do use Spiral Journal with my child. So this is, it's also a- It's also inspired by Linda Barry. And yeah. I think maybe there's something, and again, I'm not, a, but there may be something with this stuff that, you know, that left brain, right brain, you're connecting with a different part of your brain to express something by doing it visually or through drawing. And I'm a hopeless drawer. So I always think, oh no, don't make me draw, but actually it doesn't really matter that you don't, you don't have to be like, a Leonardo da Vinci or you know a great artist you can just squiggle something that you know um and, and I think there is something around how your brain works that you're using a different accessing a different part of it which maybe then enables you to think about things in a different way so there probably is like a load of there'll be people watching this that could tell us loads more around the theory about how what this makes possible yeah. but um it's a fun yeah. exercise I think you're right you have to think about the context you're working in and but maybe preface it by saying this is just you know it's going to be fun and a bit different and go with it and and see where that goes but um yeah. okay Great. thank you Liz I'm going to stop the video now thank you all